Joining us now, Democratic presidential candidate Governor Steve Bullock of Montana, who was just endorsed by Iowa State Attorney General. Oh, that's big. The first mayor, uh, statewide Iowa endorsement, uh, major, sorry, uh, statewide Iowa endorsement wow. in the race. So great to have you on the show. Good morning, um, Mika. I'm going to start. Good morning, good morning. I'm going to start asking all the candidates who jump in at this point this question. There are so many of you running. So what is so unique, so unusual, so important about you that you have to jump in, you have to join this huge, huge <laughs> range of candidates yeah. because you make the difference. Other than your winning smile. What is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> well, look, I think we are at a dangerous point in this 243-year experiment called uh, representative democracy. And fundamentally, I'm someone that can both bridge divides to make our economy and our political system work so everybody has a fair shot. I'm the only one in the field that actually got reelected or won in a state where Trump won. More importantly than that, even though, that I've actually, you know, my legislature's 60% Republican. Most of the things that people in the field are talking about, we've been able to accomplish hmm. in Montana. Hmm. And have also uh, led, even since before I was governor, when I was attorney general, really fighting against the corrupting influences of outside dollars and sort of this post-Citizens United world. And fundamentally, if we don't address that, we're never going to address the other big problems we face. So, Governor, uh, you know, we, we had quoted uh, Joe Kennedy Sr. before uh, telling someone that he was going to sell his son, John Kennedy, like soap flakes. Uh, you, you come in, there are 20, 21, 22, 23 different brands of soap flakes. Some are, uh, are much better known than you. How do you break through the noise? How does your campaign get oxygen? How do you get in a position where you can win? Yeah, no, and Joe, thanks for the question. And first, yeah, I'm late into this in some respects. I signed my last bill on Monday of this week, announced on <laughs> Tuesday. Fundamentally, um, with that legislature, I had to get things done. I got Medicaid expansion reauthorized, passed one of the best laws when it comes to keeping foreign dollars out of our overall system, froze college tuition. So. I needed to be one of them that got in. You know, I had to get my job done back at home. But I think I sell. We need to win back places that we lost in 2016. I have a proven record of doing that. We need to bridge some of the divides to make government work. Most folks turn around and say, look, it, the economy's not working for me. For the last 40 years, the average American really hasn't had a pay increase. They look at the political system. When Lindsey Graham and others say, oh, we got to get this tax cut through to make our donors happy, it's not speaking to most folks out frankly outside of New York and Washington DC and the coast yeah. so if we're not talking to them if we're not giving them a reason to vote for us not just against him we're not gonna win so I sell by showing up I sh sell by sh basically talking about the shared values we have no matter where we live and by giving people a reason to believe that both the government and the economy can work for them Governor, I suspect as you get into this race, a lot of people will look at you and say, I like this guy. He seems like a good guy. But then they'll go back to a question they may be asking themselves about Mayor Pete Buttigieg, which is, yes, he got things done, but he got them done in a state of one million people. A beautiful state, but it's only one million people. What makes you think you can run a country of 330 million people? Yeah, and what a time for American politics when you have a mayor of the largest city and a mayor of like a city of 102,000 in addition to senators, governors, other folks like that. I mean, not only have I been able to get some of this work done in Montana, but like we've led the country when it comes to the states on net neutrality, actually making a fundamental difference, protecting the internet for everyone. We've led in areas like campaign finance, far beyond Montana. And I think fundamentally, um, when you look at where, what I've been able to do and the way that I've been able to do it, I surround myself with good people. I have judgment. The difference between a governor and some is I have to deal with dang near every single issue that's being talked about right now in one context or another. So I think from that perspective, um, you bring that executive experience and it can certainly translate into uh, not just in a smaller state, but across the country. As you go from running Montana to commanding the world's most powerful army, for yeah. example, on a question that we've been talking about this morning, something like Iran, how would you be handling Iran right now? Because I think that's where people will wonder, is he ready to make that leap to the world stage? Sure. I, and I think you begin from the premise of 
what are our what do we have to do we have to protect the american people we have to continue to build our allies we have to deter our adversaries and we have to promote american values if you look at where we've been with iran when this administration came in we were actually with our allies along the way saying let's hold iran accountable and this idea of America first becoming America alone does not work for anyone. It certainly doesn't work for the safety and security of our country. So I think where you'd begin is certainly saying we need not just to be doing this alone. We need to be bringing both our allies and some of our adversaries to the table. And this should be a uniform response. So you would stay in the Iran deal then? Is that the case you'd make? I think we always could have improved the Iran deal, but fundamentally, they were complying. And until recently, we knew that they were allowing inspectors in. We knew that there was the safety and security is that they weren't getting closer to having nuclear weapons. You said in your first answer, Governor, that this is a dangerous time in the history of the country. What do you mean by that specifically? Uh, I mean, look, forget Facebook feeds or Twitter. It's even at a Thanksgiving table that I think in some respects we're becoming more and more divided. I think fundamentally people are starting to believe that government doesn't work for them. When the economy doesn't work for them and government doesn't work for them, it's no surprise that people are frustrated, they're angry, they're anxious. And what we've had is a president who's poured gasoline on that fire as opposed to trying to bring us together and figure out how we can all be lifted up. Governor, you come from a great state. You're a very likable guy. Um, in your state, you know, if you go to meet your neighbor, odds are that you're driving a half an hour. And when your neighbor shows up, he looks exactly like me. So my question to you is, this is a great and diverse country. The tapestry of this country is multicolored. Sure. Running for president means a months long conversation with America. So what do you tell someone, a parent, a single parent, of a child whose most dangerous part of the day is maybe the walk to school. Yeah. What do you what do you talk about to those people? Yeah, Mike, and I really look forward to being part of that conversation for sure. You know, both as governor as and as attorney general in Montana, I've tried to lift every single person up. And I recognize from the perspective though that there are different challenges based on <clears throat> different communities. Um, and I would never equate the different communities. But I've had some of those same conversations with Native Americans, 7% of our population in Montana. I mean, if you look at missing and murdered indigenous women, yet 7% of our population, 26% of the women that are missing or people missing in the state are Native Americans. I've done work with other different communities. So what I will do certainly is I'll show up, I'll listen more than I talk understand that people have different challenges and different historical challenges and I want them at the table to help me but fundamentally to your question too a mom in uh, south side of Chicago spent some time with former education secretary Arne Duncan meeting some kids where it was in a neighborhood where there were 130 shootings in one weekend a mom on the south side of Chicago wants the same thing as a mom in rural Montana wants. You want a safe community, you want a roof over your head, you want a decent job, you want good schools, you want to believe you can do better for your kids and grandkids than even yourself. So the values are the same, the challenges are different along the way. And I think we're finally at a place in this country where we actually have to address those unique challenges. And I'll bring people to the table to help me. Uh, so, uh, Go Governor, let's do a quick lightning round oh, here. Good. Why don't we? Uh, <laughs> what could go wrong? Go. What, we, the, what could go wrong? We'll, <laughs> we'll start with the first question where things have gone terribly wrong on this show before. Are you a capitalist? Does capitalism <laughs> work? I am a capitalist, and I think that there are parts of capitalism that's broken. I mean, the fact that a secretary or a legal assistant uh, is paying more taxes than Amazon, which had $10 billion in profits, is a problem. The fact that you had a trillion dollars of stock buybacks when, you know, 80 percent of the stocks are owned by 10 percent of the people are a problem. But I'm a capitalist, and I think what we need to do is be improving that. Okay. Uh, Medicare for all. Do you support Medicare for all or not? I want to make sure. That, well, first, this administration has been doing everything it can to destroy and rip health care from people for the last two and a half years. Everybody should have access to health care. It should be affordable. That's what I've been working on in Montana. There's ways to get to accessibility and affordability without 
disrupting are taking about 70% of the private market, private insurance, and making them have to change. A public option. So you, you, you would oppose Medicare for all then? I think there's other ways to get to the same goal, so I would oppose Medicare for all. What about free college? Uh, Bernie Sanders is talking about free college for all. What do you think about that? You know, Montana has the fourth lowest tuition fees in the nation. That's by design. When I graduated, I had what would be $175,000 of loans. We need to address mm -hmm. college affordability, and we can. But ultimately, I'll never forget that day that I wrote my last, my wife and I wrote that last check to pay off our loans. Um, I want to make sure that it's affordable and accessible, but not necessarily um, free for everyone. So how, how do you do that? I came from a middle class family. I, I cannot relate, unfortunately, to, to stories of crippling loan debt because I went to the University of Alabama and my God, it wasn't that long ago. And I think my as an out of state student, my tuition it's like $750 a semester. Yeah. I then went to Florida Law School, which, you know, is one of the better state law schools in the you country. Bet. My tuition was $1,000 per semester. Why shouldn't the federal government be able to force state schools to say, if you want our money, if you want to engage in our loan system, you have to make college more affordable for in-state students? Well, that I think that you could do. Joe, I mean, we, you could make it so that they're making it more affordable, and then both from the state and the federal side, we could actually be paying for this. If you actually look at the last decade, you know, real spending per student has dropped by about 16%. At the same time, the college loans have doubled over the last decade. Yeah. We're now at $1.4 trillion of debt for 44 million people, where the average student is walking out with $28,000 in loans. But I think then how you do it is you actually address and use that 120 some billion dollars a year that we spend on higher education. You can incentivize states to do more. It, there would be a path to make two-year college available for all, but we also got to recognize that not everybody's going to go to college. I mean, I spent a lot of time over the last few years, seven of my 10 two-year colleges, five of my seven tribal colleges. It's not even about associate's degree anymore. It's about a professionally recognized certificate or apprenticeship to give right. somebody that opportunity to be lifted and get a decent job. I've done a terrible job on lightning round. I went <laughs> oh, a little sorry. too deep in college tuition, <laughs> but, but, but it was important. Final lightning round question. Should the United States Embassy for Israel be in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? Well, I, I think it's now been moved to Jerusalem, and I don't think that the state, the United States, really got much out of that. I don't know that you move it back, but we got to get back to working toward a two-state solution. All right, Willie Geist will now ask you uh, lightning round questions <laughs> right. about Oh, I bet there's more than songs. one lightning Willie. round today. Well, I, Eddie's got a question for you, and Susan's got one first, but I do have one more at the end. Go yes, ahead, sir. Eddie. Governor Mullick, I want to go return to something that Mike uh, kind yeah. of asked you. Uh, when, when I hear the language, I want to win the state that we lost, right? I, I can yeah. speak to that part of America that the party hasn't spoken to. It, he, it here, it sounds to me as if uh, you're not going to speak to yeah, yeah. Uh, black and brown constituencies. Yeah. And many people argue that the pathway to the nomination will be through black communities and particularly through black women. And it will be. So as you pivot to South Carolina, what specifically specifically will you say to black voters uh, as we in uh, some ways we're dealing in a we're living in a moment that's been defined in some ways by Charlottesville defined yeah. by a kind of divisive rhetoric but what would you say specifically in terms of policy to black voters to say that that you that you should be their choice yeah and certainly I would first show up and listen but I would also turn around and say you know what I was raised more or less well single mom delivered newspapers the governor's house I went from doing that to raise my family in it. I had a shot at the American dream. Mm. And I know because of historical and systemic problems, so many people haven't had a shot at the American dream. And we need to actually directly address that. The idea that, um, said if you're an African American woman, four times more likely to die during childbirth than a, a white individual if much less likely to attend college. So what I would specifically say is let's look at where we've gone wrong in the past. Let's recognize that for far too many people in this country, you haven't had a shot, a fair shot at what 
I've had and others have had, and how can we specifically address how that? How would you go about heal, healing the rift that has been left by the divisive rhetoric? Of no, the yeah, well, and I mean, the divisive rhetoric and the rift was caused in the last two and a half years more than anything. I mean, he's ripped band-aids off of where we've had challenges in this country for decades. And I would want, you know, my cabinet and the people around me to look like America. That's what I've tried to do with, I've tried to make my cabinet and folks around me look like Montana. And I'd say that, you know, again, no matter where we're from, we want that shot for our kids and grandkids. And if we don't recognize that, like, this wasn't just slavery, this wasn't just segregation, this is redlining, this is things that are occurring even to this very day. There's a reason why, if you're in the lowest quintile of the economy, that, you know, 20, less than 30% of kids go to college, 9% complete in college. You have been deprived of economic opportunities many people have for a lot longer than the last two and a half years and we got to address that. Governor, switching to the economy, tariffs, yes. hitting this country very hard, particularly Montana, but it, it's more than just the farmers and, and agricultural, it's everyday Americans yeah. too, it's the wash, your washing and dryer has gone up in costs, etc. What would you do if you were in a position right now to negotiate with China, what do you want to see happen with the tariffs? Would you remove them immediately? If just I gave you that sure, power, sure. what would you do with yeah, it? Yeah, and, and look at it. In a place like Montana, our producers are getting hit on both sides, right? They're losing their markets, and any payment from the Department of Agriculture isn't going to make, replace the market when Brazil takes over. And their inputs, they're still aluminum, is that much higher. Every American at a 25% tariff to China, a family would be paying about $2,000 more per go for goods a year. So fundamentally, I mean, and again, this, it's sort of the, just this knee-jerk response that a tariff is a sort of bludgeoning instrument as opposed to what happened to working with our allies and saying it's time to open up your markets and it's time to actually make it fair. We haven't really been able to open up their markets since they got MFN status in, you know, 2000. So fundamentally, I would address, try to bring opening, recognize opening to their markets. I don't think just tariffs alone does it. I think we have to work with the international community. But what about specifically with China? Would you have, what deal would you want to reach with them? We point a lot of fingers at Donald Trump saying he's, he's playing the wrong hand. Yeah. What's the right hand? Where I think that Trump is right is that China is a threat and a threat to our economy. And from a long-term perspective, and they're looking at this long-term, not just short-term, I think that what I would end up doing is saying, let's talk about each of the sectors that we're really concerned about. I mean, they, 25 years ago, China did this in steel. So in some ways, we're fighting a battle from 25 years ago. Right now, they're doing it in tech. And negotiate, not just say we're going to have blanket tariffs and an escalating trade war, but let's actually come to the table and make sure that American goods have access to the Chinese market. When we do, we don't have to give away all of our American technology. And it's not just access for our ag products, it's access for everything in our economy. Final question for you, Governor. Final question. Perhaps the most important of the morning. I noticed in the first couple of days of your campaign, you raised a million dollars in the first 24 hours. You got the endorsement of the Iowa Attorney General. But most importantly, you also got the backing of Jeff Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> Will you pledge here and now, Governor, to give the due to place in your administration <laughs> if you are elected? You know, Jeff Bridges and I have worked on childhood hunger. Uh, other things, was excited when he came out and consider him a good friend, but a good advocate for ending childhood hunger. The dude abides, the dude abides. Governor Steve Bullock, welcome to the race. Good to have you here this morning. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Willie. Good luck out there. Uh Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.